Merry Christmas to you. Glad you're here today. We are continuing our series looking at the same couple we have looked at for the past few weeks. You know, there's so much to mine in the life of Elizabeth and Zechariah. And what I wanna talk about today is how sometimes you have to endure shame in order to experience gain in life. Uh, sometimes you have to go through a difficult season before you see the light at the end of the tunnel. If you know the story of Jackie Robinson, the baseball player, he had parents who were sharecroppers and they had a very uh, poverty-stricken life. One day his dad walked in and left him and his four siblings and to force his mom to decide to relocate, she moved to California. He enrolled in uh, the local high school there and became the first player, this is crazy to think about, he became the first player at the high school to letter in four sports in one year. He then went to the UCLA College, the UCLA Bruins, and did the same exact thing and played four sports in one year. He had an opportunity to go play in the majors. He became the first African-American baseball player. And you would think with that kind of success, he was welcomed. Uh, it was just the opposite. Uh, he experienced a lot of opposition. He had a lot of detractors, a lot of critics. But eventually he, went, he began to win people over with his winsome personality and his positive attitude. Jackie Robinson is not only one of the greatest baseball players to ever play the game. Jackie Robinson's number is retired permanently in baseball, number 42, you'll never have it again. And it's because he broke down the racial barrier. He experienced, in a sense, momentary pain for generations after him to experience gain. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth find themselves in a similar situation, although they don't know it at the time, but the years, the 60, 70 years of shame and pain for not having a child is all about to change in a moment. And they're not gonna have just any child. Oh, by the way, they're gonna have the cousin of God's son, Jesus, by the way. And everything is gonna change. And I wanna show you an insight that they teach us about perspective and how to look at life. So if you have a Bible, I hope you do. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one. And we'll consider verses 24 and 25. We like to say word at Long Hollow. We know the word changes our life. And so we wanna consider the word of God. If you're there, you can say word. If you're at home, you can do the same as well. After these days, Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. Now, we can only imagine what that was like. Zechariah is mute, so he can't speak. She actually is overwhelmed by the grace of God. That home, you have to imagine, was a sanctuary for the presence of God. You have to imagine them just overjoyed at what God is doing. She said, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away, this is key, my disgrace among the people. The word of the Lord. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, I know different people are at different stages of life today and holidays bring mixed emotions. I pray, God, that you would show us how sometimes you use momentary pain or, or even overwhelming circumstances for long-term providence and how you work everything together for your good. And so help us to gain a biblical perspective now. Speak to us now, Holy Spirit, fill me and in a way, God, that I'm able to speak your word, that people hear your voice and not mine. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Two, two insights uh, from this couple. The first one is this. Uh, I want us to remain hopeful in discouragement. I want you to remain hopeful in discouragement. I don't know if you came in today discouraged. I don't know if you feel overwhelmed, but this could be an offer uh, of encouragement to you. The, the phrase that caught me was this. She says, after she realizes she's pregnant, is that the Lord did this and he took away my what? What did the text say? Disgrace. The J.B. Phillips translation said, God took away the suffering that I've experienced from the people. 
Uh, ladies, if you're here with us today, you can only imagine what it was like to walk every day to the village well, to gather water around all the other ladies in town, wondering if they're shooting painful arrows at you. Uh, she doesn't have any kids. She has to be cursed by God. And, and not even that, just to mention uh, her own uh, criticism. I don't know if you're like me. I'm the worst critic at times. And so she's got to be thinking, is something wrong with me? Uh, am I the kind of wife I need to be? Am I, the, am, am I the type of follower of God I need to be? But she wasn't the only one that experienced that. Zechariah had his share of trouble. Uh, if you were a priest back then, and Zechariah was, you had uh, a duty to fulfill, and it was two one-week times of service in the temple. So twice a year, he would make a trip by walking to Jerusalem. He would serve for a week at a time. You have to realize that long walk to the temple every year, he's thinking that this year is no different than the last year. And one of the things I know, and you probably know this, is that he has to be around the religious, quote, elite of his day, the, the priest of his day. And we all know that religious people can be the most critical. Christians can be the most critical, right? I know this because I can, I can fall into the trap as well. I can be very critical and judgmental. Right? I'm, just, I'm just being factual. You know, I'm just telling the truth, you know? And, and the Lord broke me of that. Um, what's crazy is today, today is the one-year anniversary of the revival that started at Long Hollow December 20th last year. It's crazy to think about it. The entire revival literally almost took place in one year. And shortly thereafter, the Lord showed me a, an insight, actually showed me before and then after, he kind of reminded me of it. And he showed me, Robbie, if you can't pray for the church down the street to be blessed in spite of Long Hollow, then I will never bless Long Hollow. Let, let me contextualize that for you. If you can't pray for your neighbor down the street to get a raise at the office and you not get one, if you can't pray for your family members to get a promotion or to have a new car or a new house and you not get one, can you do that? And, and here's the caveat, and be okay with it. Like, be okay with it. Like, I'm fine with it. Oh, no, you're not. No, I'm fine with it. I'm fine. I'm fine. No, you're not. Be okay with it. You see, I realize religious people sometimes can be the most critical. I heard someone say one time, religious people hurt religious people the most because they're the most forgiving going to forgive me anyway. Might as well hurt you, right? How embarrassing must it have been for Zechariah when he's around these religious priests and they're talking in earshot distance, probably trying to hear them say, you know, Zechariah walks around like he's some holy guy, <laughs> acting like he's all righteous and stuff. We know he's cursed by God. I said this a week or two ago, not to have children uh, was a sin that was similar to leprosy. But it wasn't just that that was overwhelming. Zechariah has been waiting his entire life to do one job in the temple. Uh, just a little history of how the temple worked and the priesthood. The priests would go to Jerusalem for their duty. It was a week-long work, and uh, basically they would all gather around those who were enlisted for the week, and either the high priest or a high-ranking official would come out, and they would hand out the jobs for the week. And they actually drew jobs by lot. And the lots were, how'd you do that? Well, they did it in a couple of ways. Sometimes they gave out straws, the shortest straws, or sometimes they counted numbers and they just counted them and then the high priest would pick the number and that was your job. But here's what the, the deal. Every time you performed a job in the temple, you could only do it once in a lifetime. That's how it worked. And they did that for people to have their hand at different jobs. Now, some of the jobs were menial. You didn't want to do some of these jobs and they weren't real uh, attractive. For example, shoveling uh, the manure from the stalls. Not, not, not one you're looking forward to doing, right? You'd do it for a week. Uh, shoveling salt for the meat to preserve the sacrifices. Not really exciting on the list. Uh, sweeping the temple courtyard. Eh, not really. But then there were others who were in the upper echelon, the top tier. Trimming the wicks of the menorah candles. That was a pretty good one. You know, trimming the actual wicks that will burn the menorah candle. Or gathering the lamp oil for the lampstand. That was a pretty good one. Or what about this one? Baking the bread for the table of showbread. That was a pretty good one. But those paled in comparison, follow me, Long Hollow, to one job in the entire temple order, and that was this job. Everybody wanted this one job, and that was to burn incense at the holy place standing in front of the curtain between the holy of holies. 
And this position really was amazing. Why? Because it was the closest a human being beside the high priest could come to the presence of God. And up to this point, Zechariah hadn't been chosen for that job. He had been looked over and overlooked, but he waited for that invitation to go. How many people, honest question, how many people, uh, by show of hands, if you had, and money wasn't an object, if you had an invitation to take a trip to space on a space rocket, SpaceX, how many people would actually, money was not an object, you said, I'd go to space. How many people would actually go to space, honestly? Okay. How many people would not take that trip? I'm in that category. Well, I don't, I don't like roller coasters. I don't like sharp hills. Okay. So I, I'm definitely out of that one for sure, out of that one. And so, but here's the reality. A man named Jacob Isaacson, this year, I watched, the, I watched him take off, I watched him come down. He actually offered a sweepstakes during the Super Bowl. Three people applied, a lot of people applied. Three people were selected, and he took three civilians with him to space. One was connected to St. Jude and, so, and two other ones, and they went to space free. They didn't have to pay any money, and they took a ride to space. Now imagine what that invitation was like to get that. You're gonna take a trip to space. We're gonna cruise looking from space at the curvature of the earth at 17,000 miles an hour. Like I said, I wouldn't have gone, it makes me nervous just thinking about that, but imagine that invitation. I mean, that was the invitation of a lifetime. Zechariah is a man who's been waiting for something infinitely greater. He's not gonna take a ride to see the creation of space. Feel the weight of this. He's actually going to come into the presence of the creator of space. But he's been looked over. You have to imagine he's been called the looked over priest, right? I mean, up to this point, God has looked over him for a child. God has looked over him for a job. God has looked over him in life. And I have a sneaking suspicion some of you here are saying, well, that's how I feel. Uh, maybe you're still, in a sense, disgruntled because you didn't get the job you wanted. You were kind of passed over, overlooked. Uh, maybe you didn't get the raise you were looking for this year. Maybe you didn't get the promotion you wanted. Uh, maybe you were in a family, or even still to this day, where you're one of the siblings who are favored less than another sibling. Maybe your friends went on a trip together. You didn't get that invitation. You know what it feels like to be looked over and overlooked. I mean, that's Zechariah. But right now, God is about to change everything. Because what looks like God passing by him is actually God providentially planning to select him for the perfect time. And the perfect time is now, which is the second insight, and this is the crux of the message. I want you to get this. What do we do in the meantime while we're waiting? We adopt an eternal perspective. Now, I want to show you something from two weeks ago, if you have a Bible, uh, or three weeks ago. R.T. Kendall preached a message about how when Zechariah is in the presence of the angel, the angel says something to him. And the angel says, I'm here because God has heard. Do you remember this? What does it say? God has heard your prayer. Look at it, verse 13. Do not be afraid. God has heard your prayer. Now, why is that important? Because he hasn't given up hope. He's a man that has continued to, to pray and he's adopted a different perspective. Now, why is that an important point to make? Here's why. I want to encourage us to stop judging people based on the present moment. Let's stop judging people based on the present moment. Why? Because I want you to think about different stages of your life. Big boy, you weren't as successful as you have been right now at times. Let's be honest, right? If you don't believe me, ask your wife. She knows, right? I mean, we haven't always been at where we are today. And you haven't always been successful like you are today. There have been seasons of your life like mine when it wasn't going so well for you, right? Ma'am, it was the same with you. You remember that investment decision that you still regret, right? Think of that relation that was a debacle at the end. It did not go like you wanted. Think of that business that you thought would turn out well and uh, just went belly up. Uh, think of that job you thought would be. A, think of that move in your life. And you look back at life and you realize, I haven't always made the best decisions, which is why if it, ha listen, if it happened in your life, don't you think it happens in others' lives? And so the point I want to make is this. Different seasons 
produce different results. But God works through process, which is why we shouldn't judge people only in the present moment. Now, I'm gonna make a statement to you that's gonna shock you at first. And uh, the words I've used are are pretty uh, intentional. But I think about it even from my own life. If you would have looked at me at any time in my life prior to 2003, at any time, you would have said, this guy? You guys going to use this guy? In fact, my parents and I were talking uh, a couple weeks ago. We were reliving um, the time we were at the Catholic church when I was little. I was like 13 years old. And my uncle, who's a comedian, self-professed comedian, uh, while the priest is singing, Oh, Holy Night, that sounds like Elmer Fudd. He, yeah, and we're in front of everybody in the church and our whole family's cackling and laughing. And my mom is reliving this story. I'm like, how embarrassing. And then I stopped her. I said, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Y'all leave that, that fiasco. And on the way out from church, somebody stops you and says, do you see this little ADHD boy who was laughing, couldn't sit still? He's gonna be the pastor of a Protestant church in Hendersonville, Tennessee one day. You would have laughed that guy out the building. You would have thought, this kid right here, Rob? And if you would have seen me through any point in my life prior to 2003, you'd say, this guy right here, I always joke and say, uh, when I was strung out on drugs, the angels in heaven were looking at God like, you, you sure we got the right guy, boss? <laughs> I mean, are you sure? Because here's the reality. Your life like mine is in process, Right? God doesn't judge the present moment. God judges over a lifetime. Aren't you glad of that? I want to make this statement, and here's the statement. Here's the statement. God is okay with your present pain so that he can carry out his eternal plan. I want to say that again, and I want you to get this. It's a hard statement to swallow. God is okay with your present suffering, your present pain, your present loss, your present financial trouble, your present cancer, your present disease, your present illness, your present discouragement to carry out his eternal plan. I mean, you think about John 9 with the man born blind. God only knows how long this man has been born, been blind. Maybe he's in his 20s, maybe he's in his 40s, but his whole life was suffering. For what? For one moment when Jesus comes with the disciples and they say, who sinned, Jesus, this man or his parents? And Jesus says, neither. This brother has suffered his whole life to be a trophy of grace right now. Trophy of grace. Now, here, here's, the, here's the reality, and, and this is, again, hard to accept, but sometimes the pain you experience now doesn't make sense this side of eternity. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. But the cool thing is, one day, it will. Friends, you know what heaven's gonna be about? And I really believe this. Heaven's gonna be about God taking us through our life, back through time, and showing us the back of the tapestry. And saying, this is what you saw. Let me show you what I was doing. And you're gonna see how God does not make mistakes, and God works everything together. And you're gonna say, I had no clue how, wow. And the rest of eternity is gonna be spent praising God for how he worked in your life and mine. That's heaven, I think, amen? Amen. That's how it works. I mean, you think about the people in the town who had to repent and apologize to Zechariah and Elizabeth for what they thought of them. I mean, I think about the family members. They had to say, man, I hate it, but I thought you were cursed for 70 years. Would you you forgive me? And then all of a sudden, they have a child. And like I said earlier, it's not just any child. I mean, this is like the cousin of the son of, of God, the Messiah. This is the cousin, the forerunner of the Messiah. And, and they realized that they were quick to judge and they, they shouldn't be. I told you December 20th a year ago is, is the day God poured out his spirit at Long Hollow. Uh, for those who didn't know the, don't know the story, December 15th was a Tuesday. I was sitting with the Lord after about a nine or 10 month season of sitting in silence Uh, with the Lord, and I heard as clear as day, internal, audible voice. People say, did you hear a voice? Yes, internally audible. And I know it was God, because I'd ever saw this. I wouldn't have created it. I couldn't even have thought of this. And I heard the words, spontaneous baptism. Never seen it before, heard of abuses of it. 
Uh, I was uh, the holy man I am. I decided to wait two more days because I didn't believe it was God. You know, like there's no way that's God, right? You know, and so, you know, uh, I, I didn't have a lot of faith, but the Lord said, no, no, it's me. And so uh, December 20th on the lowest attended Sunday of our church, the lowest attended Sunday in five years of me being here, uh, we told the church to stay home. If you remember, COVID was rising in Tennessee. We had one baptistry. It was right over there. And I said, hey, we're going to offer spontaneous baptism. You're not prepared. We are. And at the end of that day, 99 people, it's hard to even say that to you, but think about that. 99 people came forward in one Sunday on the, did I mention the lowest attended Sunday in the history of me being here five, and follow through with baptism. Now, none of us knew what was coming. Like that was the beginning of the heavy raindrops that would come on the tail end of that. And you would think like church folk and religious friends would say, man, that's awesome. We celebrate with you. But actually just the opposite happened. Like I started, I didn't share a lot of this with you, but right away I started to get criticized. Our church started to get criticized. There were guys blogging against me. I remember one, one article was entitled, Why I Am Concerned About Robbie Gallaty and What's Happening at Long Hollow. That was one of the, uh, he, and then he wrote, he said, I, I followed Robbie and I do discipleship, but here's why I'm concerned. Uh, he obviously never called me personally to talk. But anyway, uh, I, had, I even had church members. This is really, really surprising. I had church members that I talked to recently who stopped me and said, Pastor, I need to confess that for the first few months uh, or even five, six months, I was skeptical. I thought they have to be manipulating. They have to be rebaptizing. They have to be coercing the situation. And because of that, I didn't experience or encounter God like I could have. These are churchmen. These are people like you sitting in the seat. Now, that's easy to do. Why? Because I find myself doing that. See, I've thought about this a lot this week, and here's what I've realized. The, the reason we think that way, and the reason we're so judgmental is you and I think the same way. Here's how the paradigm works. If I haven't personally experienced that, whatever that is, then it can't possibly happen. It can't be true, Right? Because if I haven't experienced it and I haven't seen it, then it has to be coerced. Anybody else operate under those premises, right? I mean, that's how I work. And so when I hear something that's extraordinary or hear something out of the norm, I think, man, I can't. And so what do I do? I criticize it because I haven't experienced it. But the Lord's broken me of that uh, recently. I'll tell you just an amazing God story. A friend of mine pastors a church called Champion Forest in uh, Texas, for their Christmas program, which they did this year, he's the first year pastor, just went there recently. They experienced, and this is even unbelievable saying this, they experienced through the Christmas program, 1,100 people saved last week. I mean, that's my, think about that. Yes, 1,100 people saved that week. Now, praise God, we can celebrate that. But it's easy to say, that, that's not right. They, they made that up, right? That's what we do. They made that up. I, I never seen anything like that. I'll tell you another uh, story I got from a pastor friend of mine in Houston, Texas, uh, who called me and said, Pastor Robbie, you're never going to believe this, but we just had a prayer service, and right before our eyes, we saw someone healed before our eyes. Did I mention he's a Baptist pastor, by the way? He said, so, we saw someone healed, and what do we say? That ain't true. He made that up. Let me tell you another one. This is crazy to believe too. There is a church in Middle Tennessee, Sumner County, Hendersonville, that last year baptized 1,588 people. Did you know that church? And people say, that's crazy. That's our church, by the way. People say, that's crazy. That's us, right? And some of you say, well, that's crazy. Yeah, that's us, right? People say, that's crazy. And here's what happens. And if you're like me, here's what happens. God has broken me of this because I got so good at trying to tell God what he could or couldn't do. And God said, son, I can do more than you can even fathom with your finite mind. And for years, because I was critical of what I thought God could or couldn't do, I never encountered personal revival. I want to say this with love, and I want you to get it. Friend, listen to me. The reason you have never experienced personal revival is because of your unbelief in what God could do. Let's stop being so critical 
of others. And let's start trusting that we serve a big God who's in the business of doing big things for his glory. And if we could explain it, he wouldn't be God, amen? That's the kind of God I wanna serve, amen? I don't wanna serve a God that I can repackage and compartmentalize and explain. When people say, what's happening at Long Hollow? I don't know what's happening. I can't even put it in human terms. It's God. Anybody wanna see something like that? Amen. That's what I wanna see, right? And God had to break me uh, on the porch, I told you, for a year, just had to break me of pride, arrogance, and a judgmental attitude, and self-sufficiency, and he really had to bring me to a place where I started to believe him again, believe him for big things. You know, he, he would tell me, Holy Spirit would say, stop worrying about what the church down the street is doing or the ministry over there, or stop worrying about what your neighbor, listen, if some of you prayed and believed God to work in your life as much as you monitor your neighbor's activities on, online and social media, you could change the world, literally, by the way. Like if you start believing, pressing in and praying to God, why? Because God is using everything in your life and mind to bring him glory, everything. Not only the good things, in fact, he uses the bad things as well. I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I picked up a new hobby called woodworking. I'm all in. I mean, I'm all in. No surprise, no surprise. Uh, and so you know me, I'm uh, into discipleship, so I thought I need to be discipled. So I found a retired pastor in our church. His name is uh, Fred Baldwin. Some of you may know him. He was a pastor in our area for many years. He's retired. He's been at Long Hollow for uh, a number of years, but uh, Pastor Fred was gracious enough to, to say, hey, do you know how to use a lathe? I said, a lathe? No, but boy, it sounds fun. You know, there sounds really fun. And so I go over there and honestly, it scared me so much. I'm like, this is so dangerous, Candy. I don't know about, but anyway, it was very good to look at. And so he started showing me the lathe and uh, Fred's whole family are, are woodworkers. His dad was a woodworker, his two brothers, he's a woodworker, his son's a wood. And so life, lifetime woodworkers, and uh, he started working that lathe, and it lathe was magical. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable. I went to his house, his wife, Jan, some of you may know, she was at Davidson Academy, and uh, such a precious lady. Uh, they gave me a tour of the house, and she said, basically, Pastor Rambi, everything in the house was made by Fred. And for that moment, I got a vision of the future for me. <laughs> I saw, I'm like, wow. I'm like, I can make that picture frame. I can make that chair. I, I can make the coffee table. And then I realized candy would kill me. I mean, I can't make it. And then Fred's obviously been doing his whole life and I've been two months in. But anyway, Fred's like, let's go down to the basement. I'll show you some of my, my prized pieces. And so uh, we went down to the basement and I mean, this is what I saw. I mean, just amazing wood working and uh, just show me some of his completed pieces. And, and as I was looking through the pieces, there was one piece that caught my attention. And I looked at it, I was drawn to this plate, and one of the reasons I was drawn to the plate was because of the character and the markings. Very, very distinctive, had a lot of character. And so I asked him, I said, how did you make this? Like, how did you make it look like that? And he said, oh, and Jan said, no, no, he didn't make it like that. She said, that's a certain kind of wood. I said, really, what kind of wood is it? She said, that is rotten wood. I said, rotten wood? Then he makes sense, right? Because we think rotten wood, you, you throw rotten wood out because it's not useful, it's no good. And then I realized the Lord hit me. That's how God works, right? God takes that which is rotten and he makes it, I mean, this piece stood out among all the other pieces because it was rotten wood that was repurposed. And so I wanna encourage you today, listen to me. God never wastes a hurt in our life. God is gonna take the struggles in your life. He's gonna take the difficulties. He's gonna take the losses. Listen, the empty chair this year for some of you, which will be the first Christmas without a loved one. God will use even that to carve an amazing finished product that will make perfect sense in eternity. I wanna close with a line I want you to just think and meditate on. And here's a line. You and I can't control the circumstances around us, but we can control how we respond. 
and what kept Zechariah and Elizabeth going was their prayer life and their faith that God is still good. And God is still working even when they didn't see it. So I wanna pray for us now. I know there are some right now, um, there's, there's mixed emotions during this holiday time. And so I'm gonna give you an opportunity, opportunity just to come and pray before the Lord. If you're at home, you can do it as well. Uh, just to spend time with the Holy Spirit and let him minister to you and just to help you stop being so bitter, right? Let's stop being so bitter. Let's stop being so angry. Let's stop trying to worry about the past, which we can't change. And let's trust God in the present and let's walk into the future uh, to see what God's gonna do. Let me pray for us now. And if you just feel led to come, you can come right now and just kneel before the Lord. In the first service, we had many just come and bow before the Lord. If you feel led to do that and the Holy Spirit is leading you. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, this can be a tough year with an empty seat. I, I need some direction. I'm going through a challenging time right now. I've got a family crisis and I need the Holy Spirit to minister to me. I need God to do a work in my life. And so God, I pray right now for those who need you to work. God, I pray for those who are trying to make sense of the hurts and the difficulties right now and really they don't make any sense. But we trust you're a God who takes pieces and puts together an amazing puzzle. That one day when we see the finality of that project, we will, we will truly say we serve a God where nothing is left behind, nothing is wasted. And so God, for those who you're leading to come, uh, Holy Spirit, would you put your finger on their shoulder and say, you need to go. And you just need to spend time with God. Lord, they don't need to hear from me. They need to they need to hear from you. They need to be in your presence. And so would you encourage those who come? Would you lift them up? Would you fill the void? Would you let them know that this per present momentary pain will one day make sense and you will use it all for a purpose? We ask it in the only name we know how. And that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Said.